Thank you very, very much, Victor. I hope you can hear me. I still hear we have some echo. Okay, wonderful. So, uh, I will start actually with that powerful Debbie Appleton, which is the chemical sensitivity of scanning probe microscopy. And um, this is uh, something that I think uh, could be very interesting because you will see in the end that we can tune any probe, any scanning probe instrument, whether it be scanning tunneling or scanning forge or scanning near field optics to have chemical sensitivity. And that's something that has not too much been elaborated, too much measured, uh, but which is very important actually for the whole community. So, um, just technique wise, if there are any problems, just you take the micro and interrupt me. I would like to start by thanking the organizers and also making this really possible and having the chance to really talk here in this uh, very beautiful platform. I'm sorry for not being personally here, but I would also personally also welcome and thank also Sangil Park, who is, I think, really in Freiburg now. So, welcome, um, Sangil, uh, to Freiburg. Um, I think also I would love to thank uh, Lutke and also Justina for also the technical reason and you, Victor, because once we manage these kind of, uh, kind of technical sensitivities, I'm confident that we will succeed in FM Kelvin as well. So that's actually the bottom line. So, okay, chemical sensitivity for scanning probe. Um, and if you uh, uh, do that, actually, we are naturally very much interested in also doing this with a lot of nanomaterials that we have today, whether being electronic or magnetic materials, but really to see not only the topographic or potential static images, but also really the chemistry of these things that go on. I think we are only at the beginning of really doing this because my summary will also conclude in also kind of very much perspective where to go, for instance, into time resolved measurements that are really apt at the moment really to, to really go for these kind of chemical sensitivities. Well, everything started with these two guys, which is actually 36 years back in 1982, where Gerd Binnig on the right and uh, Heine Rohr on the left actually started to really reinventing or inventing or constructing the scanning tunnel microscope. And you can nicely see actually that the first publication is really written down here in Helvetica Physica Acta and not in a, one of the more popular journals that we know today, like Science or Nature or anything like that. But the first really uh, paper is really this one here. And you can nicely see actually the date of that paper is 30th of December 1982. Just it popped up two days before New Year's Eve, actually. So, and the base, but the bottom line of this kind of scanning tunnel microscope is actually that we have an unprecedented resolution in real space on an atomic scale. And that was actually the main driving force to go to image atom by atom to have access to this kind of really fantastic new world, like Mr. Feynman was really saying. Well, they didn't really mention on chemistry at that moment. Soon later, though, actually one year later, came up another paper of them where they went into this. You will see that in a second. Well, just to get you familiar where we are, we want to do chemistry on the atomic scale that is actually on a very small length scale, typically on the size of the ball radius having a scanning force tip. And we could really compare that to uh, what we find in Switzerland, which is the Matterhorn, which has about the same size as compared to a table tennis ball. So that's actually what we do. We want to measure chemical information on the landscape of a tennis ball when being up on the Matterhorn. So we need to basically really have a very good resolution, have a very good access to these things. Now, chemical chemistry, what does that mean? How do we understand chemistry? What kind of features could we really think of? And this is actually a very nice actually cartoon that I picked from this kind of publication from Jay Atkins. And you can see a comparison of different, uh, let's say, techniques, like optical techniques on that side. We have electron techniques, PIN. We have EELs here on that side. And down here, we find something like scanning, tunneling, spectroscopy, which we will come to right in a second, which was one of the first 
instruments that would give us a chemical fingerprint, a real chemical fingerprint of what we can do. And you can see on the left scale that the spatial resolution really goes down. And still today, this is far unique in tunneling spectroscopy, tunneling microscopy, that you really achieve chemical sensitivity on that length scale. You'll find here near field optics on that, and that part here, you see not as good resolution as the tunnel microscope. We don't find AFM at all in this cartoon. AFM is somewhere here, and you will see actually we can also show that we get also as good quasi as tunneling spectroscopy resolutions. Now, what kind of parameters could we really take as a signature for doing chemistry? And this is, for instance, looking actually on the bonds, you could really look on the bondings, actually measure really what is quantitative the bond strengths. This is something really common actually when you do some imaging because you're forming bonds with your tip and your sample and you're breaking bonds. You could look on the ionization energies. This is also a very important feature. Ionization, actually the amount of energy that we have to impact on the system in order to separate an electron off the system, equal to the work function, actually. You could really look on the spin, which is also a character, as you know, from Pauli, that is very important to understand. And then we have a really a set of really optic possibilities where Niefeld optics goes into to measure fluorescence, absorption, Raman, and there's more actually that, that you could really do so. So let's see where are we actually on this kind of really scale by using the scanning probes. And that's actually what I want to really discuss with this lecture here. I would really just talk and show you that even when you do microscopy in STM, for instance, that you already see only because the chemistry is correct, because we have the right density of states. I want to continue with STS, spectroscopy, tunnel spectroscopy, and also spin polarized STM, but then also break the ice for something which I think is very um, a very strong method to really elaborate, which is Kelvin probe force microscopy that gives you direct access to work functions, which is a reflectance of the local chemistry of systems. And finally, finish with resonance sample absorption into an SNOM system, which we have also done in collaboration, just as an example, with these guys here from Freiburg with the Helmholtz Institution. So I will show some results there. And Victor, if I am taking over time, please you interrupt me and quit down. Actually, you can shut down the line, actually. That's much better. So let's start actually um, with tunneling. Tunneling is the one and really, I would say at the moment, so the best resolution method of these scanning probes. In STM, what we are do using is actually a tunnel barrier, as you can see, between two materials called probe spitz in German, or sample and tip in English. And the goal is actually to drive a current across the barrier. And this current actually typically is on the order of about one nanoamp. And if you look really on the cartoon here, it really depends on a couple of things, like the distance between these two things, which is the D here. And it depends also on this kappa, where we have inclusion of the work function difference phi. You can see that bicycle here in the cartoon. The difference is work function between these two materials. So that means actually the probability of an electron to change from A to B is always proportional to phi or the difference in phi. And hence, we have already a good possibility how to measure that. So if you put this more into mass, what we come up with is actually this equation that says, okay, the tip has some density of states, rho. The sample has some density of states, rho. And it's a question of these two things, how they really want to talk to each other. Or in more common words, it's an overlap of wave functions or of orbitals, atomic orbitals, or later, as you will see, also molecular orbitals. And that's the whole glory of the thing. If these two guys want to overlap, then they can exchange electrons, they can also exchange other quasi-particles. And once we are learning how they do so, we learn something about the chemistry. I don't want to go too much into the detail here, because that's a very complex formula already, because this M is non-trivial to really solve. But let's take this and look at an example in microscopy, which is one of the most famous examples of very local imaging, which is the seven by seven silicon reconstruction, where we can see these kind of holes, one, two, three, and four, which if you just make a cartoon, show a superstructure of the silicon, where we have exact, exactly within this seven, 
by seven atoms, which is 49, or only 12 atoms. These atoms have different chemistry, a completely different work function than the bulk has. Well, in other words, the system self-organizes itself into this kind of two triangles, six here and another six here. And even these six by six are not equal. So if you go and really solve this equation that we have before for this system, you will see that the row S, the sample density function is quite different. Hence, the chemistry on the right half and on the left half will be completely different. That's exactly what this contrast makes like. One of the very prominent examples was really that STM was able to solve this. Well, there's other things where the chemistry plugs in. Let's take back the silicon seven by seven like shown here on the left side. And that's some kind of oxygen. You see actually it is bright dot, which is symbolizing actually an oxygen. In fact, it's a measurement. It's not, a, it's not a mimic. You see an oxygen attached to a molecule actually here. And in fact, what you see is that the density or the, the probability of electron tunneling increases suddenly because this oxygen is here. Why should this be? What is really the holy grail here? The right example here shows you we have hydrogen adsorbed to silicon. This is a silicon 110 surface. And changing the bias of your sample from here positive to negative shows you that you can really go from bonding sites, shown here in the cartoon, to antibonding sites. That's exactly a pi, pi star orbitals. And you hope you can see that on your projection that there's really a dashed line in between here. You see much better action in the background because you can resolve the silicon atoms 110. Here you can't. These are rows 110, depending on the bias. Well, this best, the best example ever that was made, the first and best example, I have to say, was by Randall Feenstra, where in 1987, they said, OK, let's take exactly gallium mercenite at 110 surface, where you can see the unit cell here as a square. This is the black square, about 3 angstrom by 5 angstrom making the following experiment, tunneling either with a sample bias of plus 1.9 or with a sample bias of minus 1.9. So if you digest what's happening when you bias your sample positively is that you're going to have electrons tunneling into the gallium plus atoms. That's exactly what happens. You're probing the gallium atoms, which they are here, while for negative bias, it's the arsenic atoms. Or in other words, if you to propose these two lattices, like done here in this cartoon C, you see nicely that actually the central points don't overlap. The add atom of the arsenic is really the bright ones here, is in between these two. And you exactly, like if you do x-rays, are able to reproduce exactly where the position of these atoms are. Rand, Fenstrand and colleagues repeated the same experiment with P-doping and with N-doping, and you can now see the connection band C and valence band totally shift from here, positive voltages to negative. Yes, this is a brilliant example to really probe individual atoms. And that's possible as long, in that case, an electron can tunnel into these systems. That's clear. What's going on? Well, a cartoon that we could make up from this is actually taking really the left half and the right half where the density of states, the OS, are really shown here, which are separated by a certain barrier, which is the vacuum barrier that we see here between these two. And in fact, if you just level this up, imagine this would be just two really uh, lakes, like uh, for instance, for power stations, you would really level this up, then more electrons can flow to the right. If you would level up this one to the right, more electrons can tunnel to the left. And that's exactly what happens when you change the bias voltage in STM. So that means actually we are able to really see these density of states, or in other words, we see exactly where the energy levels of a system are. Now we can do that basically with any system, even if it's insulating, simply because actually then we're going to basically have a band gap or a shell conductors. So that means actually that this is possible in order to take an IV curve. So like in a macroscopic measurement, all you do so is you fix your tip, that means actually you fix your tip above, above your sample and not scanning, but really fix it at a certain distance. And then you sweep the voltage, which is the x-axis, by recording the current. And you can actually see this is quasi-ohmic. 
but has some kind of differences. And if you're going and do a derivation of that one, bi over db, like shown here, you see actually that this cartoon transfers into something where we have really high intensities of densities, like shown here, at certain voltages, a band gap, and another density. And if I'm going to really, sorry, if I'm going to turn this kind of cartoon to the right, as you see now, the axis upright is now the energy axis. We exactly see, like you learn in class, actually, you see the energy levels of this system. So it's really easy how this goes. This is an example where you have only these two states, which is easy to understand. Naturally, if you have more states or more electrons, it's going to get very, very complex and very, very, yeah, non understandable. That's why we then need computers to do so. Well, one prominent example I would like really to show is something that the group of Roland Wiesendanger has really also done lately. And uh, this is actually work uh, which is about 20 years old already, as you see, done by tunneling microscopy, or better to say, tunneling spectroscopy. By using an indium arsenide semiconductor, as you see here, and using that P doped version of that material, the semiconductor. Well, topography in STN doesn't show too much. What you see is actually kind of dashes. Well, we don't really know whether these are artifacts or something else, but it, okay, it could like protrusions. Now they have a clever idea in order to really do this tunneling spectroscopy in a very fantastic way, simply saying that, well, the doping not only has to be at the surface, but my defect that I want to really learn about, which is the chemistry of that defect, can also be within the bulk of my material. So that's something that is popular really mostly in everybody's world, which is actually earthquakes. Let's see actually this kind of cartoon here. Let's say we have here you know, a center which is actually emitting gravity waves. That means actually we get actually a center here the emission will be centric or concentric, or in other words, these will be spherical waves. And once they propagate, they will at some point cut the surface. You will see, see, this is a surface cut, this is a surface cut. Hence, if you really do the math of this one, and you stand exactly on the top right, at which is the epicenter, you will get circular waves at the surface. So these are circular waves, which is in projection, actually. Again, the same thing like the wave function. So they had the splendid idea to take this actual idea of an earthquake and to do really nanoscience. But this is the, actually what you see. You see at the surface when you scan with your STM, you see basically these kind of circles somewhere. So half circle surface and so on, which is really kind of very weird stuff. So they said, okay, let's plug in, a, in our computer and look actually a little bit more what's going on by changing the bias voltage V of my tunneling microscope from 50 millivolts, as shown here, to through different regimes, 50, 80, 120, up to 175. So they took one defect, like shown here, made it analogously a simulation, which is exactly this kind of earthquake simulation and exactly the cut, what you see at the sample surface. And then if you compare now the theory with the experiment, what you now see is actually that this is really overwhelming fitting very well. Please note the following. I have here a higher energy, 175 millivolts. And if you look on the density of these rings here, as compared to 50 millivolts, you nicely see actually that the wavelengths has increased. So that's exactly what you can do. You say, well, I'm looking on any kind of material, I'm looking on any mat material that scatters like a scattering wave by measuring the impact at the sample surface. And this is exactly one way to analyze. So coming back means, yes, these are buried defects and not at the top surface, they're somewhere in the, in the system. And by analyzing this kind of sequence of waves at the surface, cutting this surface, like shown here, it's able, you're able to really even say something about the chemistry of that defect, which is buried within your sample, in their case, in your Martian. Splendid work done though at 8K. So that's the only drawback. You have to do such an experiment at low temperatures. Well, let's move on. Let's look a little bit on more semiconductor in the organic systems. And we know also from class that if we take an organic system, we're not never talking about conduction valence band, but we're rather talking about the so-called uh, LUMO and HOMO levels. That means actually we have 
a lowest occupied molecular orbital and the highest occupied molecular orbital. Organics, like shown here, is a very popular topic in order to really make nanoelectron electrons. This. So what we need actually is we need some contacts that are contacting these electrodes. And it was really Wilson Ho, Wadi Ho, actually a couple of years back that was really shown for the first time that you can really do that, take really a chain of single gold atoms attached to this molecule, which is a copper perf porphyrine. You see one, two, three, four fold, a, a copper atom in the center. Another lead on the other side, and hence really fulfilling the condition of biasing through these two wires, this single molecule. So we're talking about single organic molecule electronics. Well, that's a dream. It's not really working yet, I have to say. But nevertheless, from the physics point of view, we come back to exactly what we saw before in the semiconductors. Instead of having conduction and valence band, we now have this lumo and homostate, and we tunnel into the lumo, or we can really, really empty the homo into the metal, for instance. So it's the same story. Now, the big drivers of this kind of organic electronics sit again, like the first days of STM, sit again in Rischlikon in Switzerland. And what they've done actually, which is Sasha Rep here, that you see here, this is actually reference. They took a very simple pentacene molecule, one, two, three, four, five rings of C6 molecules. And then actually doing exactly as you can see nicely, doing spectroscopy, put the tip permanently on top and then measure an IV curve like I've shown before, which is the current red here on the left, and which is the voltage on the bottom. Now the red current stays the same, close to zero, as you can actually see, and then goes up again. And that's exactly the values they find. Actually, the HOMO level is at minus 24.4 volts down here, the LUMO at plus 1.7. So a band yeah, typically, which is as big as four electron volts. So then math-wise, you do the derivative, the IRDV of this curve, of this measure curve, and you can actually see the maximum of this HOMO, the maximum of this LUMO, and the rest is basically data, electronic data, I have to say. So fantastic work, which led them to really do some more actually work. In fact, they said, okay, why can't we really write a textbook chapter by looking really in the HOMO LUMO of this kind of Trosovina pentacene molecule by looking at the chemistry of this system, looking at the HOMO LUMO system? And that's exactly what they did. They said, okay, let's do a comparison BFT calculation and then do the measurement. And you see the measurement done by STM with two different tips. But both of them show exactly the same quasi homo behavior, depending whether you cover your tip with a pentacene molecule or you take your tungsten tip barely as it is. So this is really textbook quantum mechanics. The best thing I would say that you can really use for your students when they want to really learn something about these kind of fundamental actually homo lumo stuff. Right. Again, our homos and lumos are now the sum or with different density of states, as you guys know, a lumo and a homo are the molecular orbitals. So what we do mathematically is actually we're going to superpose different wave functions, elementary wave functions of SP and so style in order to really generate these kind of density of states. But that's only a trick because we know it's a linear system. My Schrodinger equation is linear, so that's really easy. Fine. Well, STM. STM is fantastic for that, as you saw. One thing on top of that is spin polarization. Uh, electrons not only have their really uh, charges, but they have also spins, like shown here, black, no, sorry, red and, and green. And you can do the same trick now by tunneling into a density of states, either using equal orientations or disequal. You see opposite there. Yeah? And that means exactly that you can fill states either with the right on the top or with the wrong spin position. In fact, this gives you the following cartoon that you nicely see then actually that where you see on the surface of iron, for instance, shown here as a monolayer, measured with a tungsten tape, you can nicely see actually how you can pull into or out of these states giving exactly the spin structure like a spherion. So, in fact, this is exactly what some of the microscopy can do. Now, we would like to really continue with AFM, but after you see, 
but, but you have to see that actually um, in AFM, we have also the possibility to measure tons of other forces. So what has not been done, and I would like to really say that really crystal clear is whatever you saw now here from STM in principle can be done with an AFM as well, because you can measure exactly quantum contacts. You can also do some quantum mechanical tunneling from an AFM tip in your system. So everything shown here is exactly possible. I have also to say that very little has been done. So very few people try to tunnel with an AFM tip into a conductive system. And that's maybe half of the world missed at the moment. Nevertheless, let's continue now with AFM. And if you do so, we would like to really go for materials which are basically like these guys, non-conductors, which are cells or organic materials that are really having wide band gaps. So biomaterials, semiconductors. So how can we measure there? And in fact, we are lucky that this guy, Chris Gerber, was really breaking the ice in order to inventing 1986, 32 years back, this atomic force microscope. And as the word says, atomic force microscope means that we are looking actually the atomic forces, or in other words, interactions which are really chemical bonds. So an AFM, which you see on the on, on the left side actually, is nothing else. Uh, on the right side, sorry for that. An AFM on the right side is nothing else than a tunneling microscope that has been hooked up in a very strong spring. You see the spring K, and if you make your spring K stiff, you end up with an STM. If you make it really sloggy, actually, you're getting actually access to other forces. But that means, to just say it again, if your K spring constant is stiff enough, you can do exactly anything that STM can do. So that's something that might be really more elaborated in the future. Well, the funny thing about AFM is now that we have the possibility to look on chemistry at different force length scales, force interaction schemes. For instance, if you go for short range forces, it's a chemical force. That's exactly what makes bondings, strong energies, typically three, four electron volts bonding size. If you go a little bit further away, electrostatics, magnetics, you can also access the local chemistry through, for instance, other beams like Kelvin. So that means actually, I would like to show, first of all, two examples for the chemical forces interactions, uh, which are both either done on repulsive regime, that means actually when you look in the force regime or on your, your attractive regime. Both regimes are really very good for working on it. The other two examples. First of all, we see a sodium chloride island that has been measured in Basel actually with non-contact atomic force microscopy. So you see actually these kind of ad atoms, which are really the atoms of one single sodium chloride island. Now, let's focus first of all into the center here. And you can also see from this atom, really marked with an arrow, that we have a circumference, which is one atom to the top, one to the right, one to the bottom, and one to the left, and exactly one also to the next layer below. Or in other words, if you count the so-called coordination number, you see that this atom has a five-fold coordination. And let's move from this atom to the rim, this atom here. Actually, this atom sees only one atom here, one atom here, and one atom to the right, and one on the bottom. That means coordination is only fourfold. And if you go on with this game, you go to the corners, you see actually there's only one to the left, one to the right, and one to the bottom, which means threefold. Or in other words, what we are playing with is now how actually this kind of uh, atoms, in, the, in that case, the chlorine atom, is really coordinating back towards its neighbors, the sodium atoms. And hence, we have something which is exactly then reflected in the electrostatic energy of the system. And that's why we see the blurring of this here and the blurring here, and no blurring here. It's not simply because of the resolution that is lost of the AFM tip. No, that's not. But it's simply a reflection of this kind of coordination that uh, ends up in a higher electrostatic energy. Second example on the right, C60 on gold, 101, measured by Christoph Lopacher you know, with us in Dresden with the big Mammut machine. And what we see here is actually that the C60 here on the gold forms islands. And these islands, if you zoom in, have a fancy structure where you see two single bright C60 molecules. 
and you see one dark C60 molecule, and then again bright and darks. Now we found out actually that these C60, when they are bright, lying on the gold, this is bare gold 111, a good example, actually lie on their C5 fold surface. You know, C60 has 12 six fold surfaces and Oh no, sorry, I don't know, 10 six fold and, and 12 uh, five fold. And the, here they lie on their five fold surfaces, while they on the other side here lie on the six fold surface. Reflect this exactly in the chemical bonding strengths to the AFMT. Interesting. So we see actually that chemical bonds can directly be reflected with a simple scanning on the surface. Now let's go for Kelvin. Mr. William Thompson, later known as Lord Kelvin of Larks, actually proposed to use Kelvin profiles to microscopy by using a simple metallic vibrating electrode in front of a sample that also can be metallic or semiconductor, applying a DC voltage and then actually doing two experiments. Either you say, well, I want to balance off the voltage tension. That means actually, in modern words, we act the equilibrating the Fermi levels, as you see here. And since these are two different materials, the work functions phi one, phi two are different, giving rise to a current I, which is non-zero. I would call this, this is a transport experiment, simply because you always get about an imbalance and current will flow all the time as, as soon as these are close together. Second example, you can say, well, I'm going to level off one of these surfaces by the simply applying a voltage, DC voltage, in such a way that my current I, current I goes to zero. Or in other words, phi one and phi two are now hoovered up as much as there that these kind of um, uh, let them, uh, that, we, that they form a straight line here. In other words, this is actually the bias that you apply to the EDC. Well, scanning force microscopy is ideally suited to really incorporate this probe force microscopy of Kelvin. That means actually using the cantilever apply an AC and a DC voltage, vibrate that, and hence get an electrostatic force in addition to that, where you get exactly access and you, you see this phi again. This is the work function that we already saw in STM. You remember the work function drawing that I was showing before. So now we have access to this one as well through a completely different mimic. And it was Dolores Zerbeck who was proposing actually 2005 back a very elegant way how to measure this. So let me show actually some results of this. You can really get quantitative access to a lot of um, uh, uh, chemical inputs of this surface on non-conductors. And the example here shows you, for instance, a potassium chloride surface put on gold. You see nice line topography, some islands, and you can say, okay, it's going up, it's going down. But who is who in, in this new graph? We don't know. So what you do is actually you hook up your Kelvin probe measurements with a two kilohertz sideband modulation, a one volt modulation, and then actually you see nicer that the surface potential, this delta phi, gives you a huge contrast between black and white, which if you go for statistics, is really at two peaks, one peak at, at this position, which is the potassium chloride because it's darker, it's lower in voltage, and you see the gold higher potential so the tension separated by 909 plus minus 1.4 millivolt. You see, actually, this is a fantastic accuracy, but this is really precise, even quasi precise than yesterday. We've done such an experiment by changing the cationic radius now, not only using potassium chloride, but going through all these halides, as you see here. And you can also see they go fantastically in line with the cationic radius and the surface potential. Or in other words, the chemistry is really linked to the cationic radius. It's a clear connection. That means actually this gives us a lookup table in order to differentiate in the mixed system who is who. Second example, we come back to the porphyry molecule you saw before, one, two, three, four legs, and the copper atom in the center. Now what we do is actually we did this molecule actually on top of a copper surface, one, zero, zero. This is in vacuum, I have to say, but at room temperature. So what you see actually is here now that we see topography islands that are forming here of this copper porphyrin on copper one, zero, zero. But if you look again on this Kelvin signal, you see fantastically actually that 
you see, have a much better insight into the system simply because you see, in fact, the four legs of one single molecule, one, two, three, four, which are charged negatively. So it's these porphyrins, these butyl legs in the porphyrin that are taking up the electrons. So this means that this delta phi resolution, the work function resolution that we find here, is on the same order like an STM. So it's really equally good. And that's some kind of really work we want to like to, to work with you guys actually too. Last example, graphene. Graphene is a very modern type of material where we have really the graphite surface. And if you clear this off, of where you see here is the uh, an STM image of an SP3 hybridized, and you see an STM image of an SP2 hybridized. What you can see basically actually with your contrast in CPD in Kelvin is actually you see with the Kelvin, the fantastic layers, one, two, three of these different graphene layers. You can nicely see one, two, three layers in the optics as well. But there's more to say. Tino Wagner found that a couple of years back that you can also say that these layers are changing in the so-called quantum capacitance, which is actually the density of states per unit cell and also per volume. Or in other words, this quantum capacitance, which is the second derivative of this Kelvin, lets you differentiate even between different hybridization stuff, like SP3, which is a two-layer stuff, and an SP2 hybridization at a certain bias voltage. But this is something that has not been repeated by anybody, not on any other materials like molybdenum disulfide and things like that. So there's a plenty of room open actually to the future. For the rest of the time, I would now like to switch for the last five slides to the last topic, which is near field optics, SNOM, which is also a scanning probe technique. The way we do this today is just shining light from any kind of laser source onto the tip, inducing a dipole into the tip, which is called the tip dipole, and then inducing a sample dipole into your molecules. These two guys talk to each other and radiate back to your detector anywhere in the far field. So we take profit that any standard AFM can do this kind of scattering technique. You can do scattering. That means actually elastic scattering, looking at the same energies. You can also measure the Raman spectrum, which is vibration. You can also measure, measure the absorption by scanning the wavelength here. You can also look at the fluorescence with this kind of technique. So too few things have been done. So for simply also because too many techniques have been lacking, for instance, also the light sources. So we've done some examples and it would simply break the ice for some kind of material contrast, which is really the chemical contrast between silicon dioxide and silicon on a very industrial DRAM sample, like that, as you see here. Electron microscopy is bad because they cannot confront between silicon dioxide and silicon because the silicon dioxide is not even visible for the electron microscope. You see here all these dashes here. It's not voids, but they don't see it. So we did that actually with this kind of near-fit optics using a wavelength of 9.3 microns, that's a CO2 laser. And the result is shown here. You see widely the SIO2 with a very good resolution. And you see the silicon in black simply because the silicon dioxide is resonant at this wavelength. So we can say that we can probe any material for its really absorption or resonant absorption. And hence with a resolution, Again, ways below the diffraction limit. In that case, lambda would be 1,000. Second example, you don't have to be at the surface. Let's come back to what uh, I showed you before with the birds p-doped in your marcenite. So same happens with SNOM that you can really look below the surface. Here's a sample where we have barium, uh, sorry, bor doped uh, implantations on, into silicon 100 nanometers. You probe that with your cantilever. And then actually you can say, I'm going to change the wavelengths in order to excite that resonantly. You see here the wavelengths between 11, 12, 13 microns. In fact, this is all the data that we collected for plugging this in into a model, which is actually a plasmonic model. We find exactly the dielectric constant, which is the chemical, let's say, macroscopic uh, polarizability of this Bohr atom in here. The fit is fantastic, as you see here from these numbers. They really fit equally good between experiment and field. 
So my last example now is the recent work that we did together with the uh, Helmholtz group here in uh, Freiburg. This was really driven by Tamas Perkala, and what we had is actually something which is really out of the mind, which is this kind of a ugly or dirty crystal. It's very nice also, you see, but it's nothing that you could really stick into a FM because you have to polish it, and that's exactly what Tamas did. We took this kind of calcite pyrite, which adsorbs with this KDX through two xanthate molecule. And as you see, this is a charge complex, and we did the same experiment like shown before, testing it by different wavelengths. And once we did these different wavelengths, you can see now it's naturally, according to the different wavelengths here, by using the CFC laser, gives us a bright contrast at 8.8 centimeters in blue, which is infrared though, but which tells us these molecules stick preferentially to these areas. So we could interpret that really in a very nice paper that this is really the preferential adsorption site for these molecules. Well, that does not bring us. Let us teach you go. Well, we should are looking for fingerprints, chemical fingerprints, but this means actually, if you use optics, these fingerprints are always different. If you take metals or semiconductors, it's more into the ultraviolet. Metals are very nice in the visible range. But the modern type materials like graphene and so on, two dimensional electron gases, topology insulators, they rather like screening for infrared lights. So I would break the ice that these combinations of scanning probes, of Kelvin probe, and together this infrared would really be something that you should go for in the future. Simply because you can exert electronic, you can exert atomic, that means polarizability or even vibronic dipole resistance for their resonances. This is an open field, and this is something that I would say keeps us really busy for the next 50 years. So let me summarize. I wanted to really show to you that I believe that we can really use all these kind of things, fundamental instrumentations, measuring forces, measuring optics, and measuring currents, transport, that all have the capability of really having a chemical sensitivity. The only thing is actually that you have to choose between different modes compared to those. But does it bring us to the future? Well, I would love to see that more time resolved stuff is out. At the moment, everything, also what I showed today, is really static. So if you go for dynamics, they could also probe excited states. And you have some kind of ideas, for instance, with Kevin, how to do that. Has some kind of ideas how to do that. The slum. Also, once you do these kind of measurements, I could imagine that a lot of external stimuli, like for instance pressure or magnetic fields, would really look would really change these kind of local chemistry because electron states will certainly be affected by these kind of stimuli. And the last but not least, we're working into a field at the moment where we are going to combine these kind of tips with nano Raman and moreover with nano cars, which is coherent anti-Raman, anti-Stokes Raman uh, spectroscopy. This is something which is uh, very uh, familiar and has a much higher output at the moment. And with this, I would like to finish my talk and thank you. Thank you, uh, Luca Zeng. I hope you hear you hear the clapping of the audience, so the yes. audience seem to enjoy. Yes, thank you very much. So um, yeah, we're just in time. Uh, it's maybe just time for one quick question from the audience. Time is very limited. We're already a bit late. No, no. Maybe one quick question uh, from my side. You showed this slide uh, from the PhD third thesis from uh, Mr. Zerbeck, uh, the copper surface where you showed the topography and also the surface potential. Uh, if we could go back to the slide. This one. Yes, right. So we see like in the topography is, is 
quite blurred in comparison to, to the surface potential. So first question would be, so was this measured in ambient conditions or was it like low temperature, uh, ultra high vacuum? No. I hope I said that that was ambient, but it was actually an under ultra high vacuum. Okay. So okay. the temperature was room temperature, but yeah. ultra high vacuum. Ah, okay. This is simply okay. because the Q, the Q value of the cantilever goes up when you go into vacuum, and hence you get even a better resolution for your Kelvin. But you can also use, for instance, uh, artificial uh, Q control in order to increase the Q value. So from that point of view, there are many, many different methods. But uh, the the temperature is not low temperature. Room temperature. So, so would that mean we kind of uh, can overcome some of the limitations we have for topographic, topography imaging when we use uh, uh, like the Kelvin probe uh, method to, to analyze the surface? That's exactly one of the bottom messages. Uh, one thing is actually, uh, first of all, go for FM and then use also crew control, exactly. All right. So, oh, one more question from the audience. Sure. So, hello, Urs Polke from Freiburg. Uh, you showed uh, very nice uh, results uh, from the flotation of the Schalke parite or the, the surface characterization. And uh, I would be interested, what is the resolution on one hand uh, where you can distinguish between uh, adsorbed uh, xanthinates or not? And the other hand, are you able to identify something on the surface why this uh, adsorption takes uh, place at this supposed uh, to be high energetic sites. Okay, a um, couple of many questions that I would like to disentangle. Um, the resolution typically with this N SNOM, or, uh, with S SNOM, typically is on your about best case scenario below, let's say 30 nanometers. So that's about the size of it that we have at the moment. Uh, it depends on how you measure that. We all are a little conservative. Some of the people would say, well, you take the slope, we take the structures. So we take really simple structures, we take the full structure. People say if you go from low to high, then you end up with something like five nanometers, which other people have also published. We say 30. That's the first thing. Second is um, adsorption sites. I mean, this we tried to prepare as flat sample surface as possible, and then also have sites in comparison where there's non xanthine actually on it. That means actually um, you would have a reference sample and the Kelvin stuff actually is able to measure what is going on. So you have at the same time when you do the absorption process a couple of sensitive measurements because as you saw this enzyme or this SNOM actually works exactly like an AFM does. That means Kelvin runs for free with it. So you measure the potential change or in other words, you can take this as a trigger that something has happened. Because the potential surpassing a certain value means something like the xanthine has to be there. Well, the problem in this kind of set of experiments was there were a lot of other possibilities also around. The surface was not as clean as I would have liked to. So one should start back into some kind of really more, let's say, laboratory style, um, um, porphyrin stuff, and go really step by step in order to analyze who is who. It's like in bio that you say, okay, I'm going to really learn step by step what is, what is going on. We can add exantines, we can add some other stuff, and then we can mix them together and then see exactly how much we can confront them. Okay, so thank you very much, uh, Professor Eng, for this uh, very interesting and nice overview of uh, probing chemical sensitivity with SPM. And yeah, so, and have a good time in Australia. <laughs> Thank you very much. All right. Thank you guys. Perfect. So, yeah.